Hello, ElixirConf. I'm Connor Sinclair. Today, I want to share a really interesting idea with you, how Elixir's language features and just a sprinkle of metaprogramming can turn ordinary Elixir modules into live, LLM-ready, dynamic functionality, all with just a single line of code. Sound completely crazy? Well, it is, so let's dive into it. Just a bit of background first, I work for Multiverse. We're an edtech based, an edtech unicorn in, based in the UK on a mission to build an outstanding alternative to university and corporate training. We partner with top companies to deliver world-class digital apprenticeships across data, business, and tech. One of the most interesting challenges of building an apprenticeships platform is in making learning truly applied. Because people learn best when their new skills are tied directly to their real-world day-to-day work. And that's exactly the problem that Atlas, the product that I work on, is built to solve. Atlas is our AI-powered coach and learning tutor. It's a large language model application enriched with deep knowledge about the learners, uh, their journey, their progress, and their goals, all grounded in the, the, the really world-class learning materials created by our learning design teams. This transitions us nicely into large language models. So you've all undoubtedly heard of them at this point, and I'm guessing that some of you have probably used them as well. Uh, but just to put a definition around it, an LLM, as I'll refer to them in this talk, is a neural network trained to predict the next token in a sequence. It's, uh, you can think of it like a token predicting machine. Like You feed it a stream of tokens, where a token is a, a word or part of a word or just a few characters, and it will run that through its internal model and, uh, and output the, the, the next most likely uh, token in response. So it's tokens in, tokens out, just scaled up until it feels like intelligence. When building applications on top of large language models, you structure the interaction as a conversation, a sequence of messages in a chain. The first message is the most important, the system message. This defines the overall tone, rules, and behavior of the conversation, setting the foundation for how the model will respond. You can also include any important context here, uh, stuff about the user, or like stuff that should be uh, known about in, in the actual um, in, in the conversation. So after that, once you've set your system message, you then add each user message to the chain, and the model will respond with an assistant message in response. In Elixir, we have the Langchain library for interacting with LLMs. I found Langchain to be powerful and really thoughtfully designed, and really does make working with LLMs in Elixir seamless. As you can see from the basic example in the Langchain docs, uh, Elixir syntax is actually a perfect fit for building these LLM chains. First, we create a new chain and specify the LLM we want to use. We then add a tool to the chain. I'll explain what tools are shortly. And then we start adding messages to the chain. First, the system message, and then the user message, before finally running the chain and getting the response back from the model. Langchain gives us a common interface across multiple LLM providers. Uh, there's plenty you can choose from. There's OpenAI, that's the company behind ChatGPT. There's Anthropic with their Claude models. Uh, Gemini from Google. Olama lets you run models locally. Uh, there's Bumblebee for Elixir-flavored uh, models as well and also Mistral, which is an open source French model, although the rest of the models will speak French to you if you specify it in the system message. Okay, so tools, sometimes called function calling. These let you add additional capabilities to an LLM. It's a crucial concept in making LLM applications agentic, giving them the ability to take actions in the world. In a functional programming sense, it's where the side effects happen. It's uh, where the model can trigger real world operations rather than just generating text. Uh, so in Langchain, um, defining a, uh, a tool is, is really easy. Oh, wait, I've skipped a slide and we need to see it. Very important. Here's how it works. We've got AI generated Jose to show us. Uh, you, uh, as part of the system message, you provide a list of tool definitions. Those are descriptions of the functions that can be invoked uh, during the interaction with the LLM. When the model decides the tool is needed, it responds with a specially formatted message asking the application to run that particular tool. So then back in the application layer, on your server, you, you execute the tool, and the result of that execution is passed back to the model to produce its final augmented response, now like enriched with the real-world data from your tool. In Langchain, defining tools is really straightforward using the function struct. You provide a unique name for the function, um, and the most important part, a description. This description is what the LLM is going to use to decide when to actually run your tool and what kind of output is expected from it. In practice, this is actually where you'll end up uh, focusing most of your time, iterating on the exact wording of that description, trying to get the, the LLM to call it at just the right time and given just the right query. You can also provide a parameter schema. This is um, a, a list of properties that we pass as arguments to your function. Um, each property can have a, its own type and also a description. Again, very important, because this is going to tell the LLM what, what the value should contain when it calls your function. 
And then we get to line 14 here, which uh, is a, an Elixir callback, a two-arity function. Uh, the first argument, args, comes from the model uh, that's generated by the LLM. And you have context. That's the, the state that you can put onto the chain. Stuff about the user can be placed here, and you can use it in the invocation of your functions. At that point, you're just in Elixir land. You can do anything you want at this point. You can call APIs, uh, kick off background work, uh, yeah, any computation you want. And then finally, when you're, you're done, you respond with an OK tuple uh, with a string. And it's that string that will be passed back to the model to produce that final response. OK, so just a quick mention of a couple of other useful uh, structs in Langchain. There's the prompt template. This is a way you can write EX templates uh, for your system messages so that variables can be baked in. And it also lets you compose different system messages together, system uh, uh, prompt templates together, which becomes really important because as you start building these applications, the system message gets longer and longer and longer, and you're handling more and more cases. So breaking them up into different layers uh, becomes a really important thing to do, and Langchain gives you some tooling for doing that. A routing chain lets you stack a number of different chains together. So if you were to zoom out a layer and you have multiple chains, each with different uh, functionality, different capabilities, different system prompts, you can put a smaller, a smaller LLM in front of it using a routing chain, which will read the user's request and then decide which is the most applicable chain based on that, based on the query. So you can imagine separating out, say, like a, a support bot chain uh, and a Socratic learning chain. And then the, root, the, the routing chain would determine which is, is the best fit for, for what the user is actually asking about. OK, so what do all of these uh, Langchain data structures have in common? They're all implemented using Ecto chain sets, which um, when I was digging into the Langchain source code, I found this was quite an interesting detail that since Elixir doesn't have like, a full type system yet, uh, we, using an Ecto chain set, the boundary of a library just to validate and structure inputs makes a lot of sense. Um, and so I thought it was an interesting detail just to call out. Another thing to mention in the area of tools and function calling is MCP, the Model Context Protocol created by Anthropic. This is a way that you can bundle together a number of different tools and prompts and think resources, things like files, all together in one server, which an LLM is then aware of how to interact with. These MCP servers come in two different flavors. You have a remote web server, which when an LLM wants to call a tool on that MCP server, it initiates a long-running HTTP connection. And then when the, when the tool is finished, it results are streamed back down to the model using server sent events. And then you also have a standard I.O. based server, which is something which would run on your own machine, typically a, a node or a Python command or something like that. Um, and then again, it's a long running connection, this time communication happening over Unix pipes. So both of these are long running connections, uh, and they need a client to, to manage, and manage that connection. Um, and this is just this is exactly where Elixir can really shine because in production you're going to want these processes to be supervised. You're going to if they crash they need to come back up gracefully and process supervision, fault tolerance. This is all this is all exactly what Elixir was built for. There's a library called Hermes which is designed specifically for managing these kinds of MCP connections, um, and I've had some good success with using it. Here's the configuration for setting up the file system MCP server. So it might be a bit small, don't know. Um, but first off, on the left-hand side, you set up a transport, this time over standard I.O., um, setting up the file system uh, uh, MCP server. And then you collect a Hermes client to it. And it's that Hermes client that you'll be calling tools on. So there on the right-hand side in the example, that's, that's how you would go and call the, the read file tool, which exists on the, on the file system MCP server. The interesting thing about the file system MCP server specifically is that it gives an LLM full read-write access to a given directory, uh, which means that an LLM can decide it wants to, to read a file, it wants to edit a file, it wants to delete a file. All of that is available just from this one MCP server. OK, now for something completely different. Let's talk metaprogramming and macros. So I'm going to be completely honest with you. The amount of metaprogramming and macros we're going to be writing is going to be incredibly light. Um, but I just want to dig into a couple of very specific Elixir metaprogramming features, which are going to unlock some very interesting capabilities. So let's just start off with what are macros. Simply put, a macro is code that can write more code. It's, uh, it, you write something very concise, and it will ex be expanded out into something much more verbose behind the scenes. Let's zoom in on one related feature, um, module attributes. So module attributes are compile time constants. They let you run some computation whilst Elixir is compiling, before your application ever actually runs. By default, each module attribute holds a single value. And if you try to, to set the same module attribute multiple times during compilation, it will just overwrite the previous value. But instead, you can set um, accumulate as an option. And then instead, it will be a list. And you can add multiple values to it in the same module. 
An example of this you'll have seen in the wild probably is with the tag module attribute from XUnit. Um, here you can tag multiple tests within the same, the same test module, and um, at runtime you can actually do mix test dash dash only and run them with that name um, amongst other things that you can configure uh, using that module attribute. Dot comments, these are a very special kind of module attribute and one which exposes a runtime API for interacting with them. So we've got here code.fetch docs, uh, you give it a module name, and from that you can get the module doc, but then also a list of every function, every public function, which is in that module with its name, its arity, and the associated dot comment. All of that is accessible to you at runtime. Okay, so I wanna show you some, some magic now. Uh, I wanna show you how you can take an ordinary Elixir module like this, and just using the doc comments on each function, make those functions callable inside an LLM chain without any boilerplate, no, no wiring up every function manually, just a single macro that use LLM magic. You can register every function in the module automatically. So what's, what's actually happening under the hood? What kind of metaprogramming wizardry can make something like this possible? It's actually shockingly simple. It's literally just this nine line block. You set up a using macro and then you quote this very special magic is real function back into the calling module. So quote is like copy and paste. It's like take this block and then wherever this macro is called, paste it as if it was there. So the resulting module might look a little bit like this. If, uh, if you, that's how you could imagine it. It's just magic is real is just placed here instead. So why magic is real? Well, it could be called anything at all, but the naming of that particular function is unlikely to clash with anything you're gonna have written in your own systems. So it seems pretty safe to avoid overwriting anything. Okay, so then how do we consume these modules that now expose this special function? Well, I have this get functions function. Sorry about the amount of times I'm gonna say function over the next few minutes, but that's unavoidable. Um, so you first off, uh, I'm, I'm loading every single module into uh, the running Beam instance. And I've had some discussions here at the conference about whether this is actually needed, and it might be that in production this isn't the case, but I've only been running my demo locally. Um, but basically the Beam is, it, although Elixir is compiling all the modules uh, which are specified, it's not actually loading them at runtime because it can't see that they're directly invoked. So, uh, th but you can use this escape hatch to just go through and get every single module in the application spec and ensure that they're loaded. And then we iterate over every module that is in the system, and we look for any which have the magic is real special magic function. Um, and from there, we can just do code.fetch docs on it so that we get all of the function docs. And then I'm just skipping a bunch of the unwrapping, but you can see that because we have a list of these functions with their name, arity, and, uh, and, and the dot comment, we can form Langchain functions out of them. So the name will just be the function name. The description, that'll be the dot comment, uh, which we can put in there. We know how to call it because we have kernel.apply, so you can, we already have the module name, we have the function name, and then the arguments can just come from Langchain. And then you're probably wondering, okay, but what about params? In my example, I've just got a, um, another block within the doc comment that's just like another, uh, another heading, a bit like you've got examples for your doc tests, um, which is just parameters, and then like a list of like name, type, description. But you could do that in a bunch of different ways. That's not really that important. Okay, and so then how do we consume them? How do we add them to the chain? Um, that's uh, very easy. We just do add tools and then just call those get functions. Um, and then like that, any module which has specified that macro will have all of their functions added as tools. Simple, simple as that. Okay, so oh, we should probably see it in action, I suppose. Um, let's get that out of the way. Okay, so here I have a, it's a live view app, and it's hooked up to an LLM chain. Um, it's, so I, I can just, if we start with the, just a basic example, very difficult to see where the mouse is. There we go. Basic example that's uh, in the Langchain docs, which is, where is my hairbrush? Okay, so this should, it's gone away and called our item locator function, which has already, uh, already been implemented, um, and it's found that the hairbrush is in the drawer, which is fantastic. Okay, so I told you about the file system MCP server. Um, I've actually got that hooked up in this application. And the directory that I've given it is its own source code. And so what it can do, it means that this LLM will be able to, to edit any of the files which in the running live view, which means that we should be able to see them reflected in real time in this chat. So uh, let's, have a, let's just get it to do something. Let's get it to do something crazy then. Uh, I can just speak it. Um, I don't really like the theme. Let's go light theme rather than dark theme, uh, please. It's always important to be polite. It's giving it a go. 
Okay, so it's trying to edit the file. It actually failed the first time. Oh, whoa, whoa, sorry about the blinding light theme. There we go, that's pretty cool. So that's cool, that's great. It can edit its own files, that's, that's quite nice. Um, but we've been talking about how you can have uh, Elixir functions automatically picked up and just added to a chain. So let's do something, something along those lines. So let's, um, let's say, uh, write me an Elixir function which will uh, return a random proverb about Elixir. Let's see what this comes up with. Might have to give it just a second longer. Might be a bit of a harder thing to do, maybe. Oh, it just one-shot it. Wrote a file. Very difficult to read all this. Sorry about that. OK, so that's generated something. I've created a new Elixir module. So all being well, we should be able to ask it, um, let's see, give me some wisdom about Elixir. <laughs> Voice to text is good. OK, so it, it ran that function that it had already written, and it said, uh, immutability changes the world without changing the data. OK, I guess that's pretty, some pretty good wisdom there. Um, OK, let's, let's try something else then as well. Let's say, um, let's say uh, write me a function which will trigger confetti to be shown on the, on the screen whenever the user mentions success. Let's see how it does with this one. It's giving it a go. Sorry about the scrolling. I should probably fix that. I've created a new module. OK, brilliant. Um, that sounds like a success. Why am I typing it? I could have spoken. Oh, well, there we go. Whee! Confetti. Nice. Nice. Good fun. OK, so let's get this going again. Uh, sorry, very hard to get the mouth to work. There we go. Um, yeah, so I think that all that's really left to say is thank you for your attention. Um, this has been a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, I hope that you have found it inspiring, at least, how the flexibility of Elixir can be combined with like, some of the new capabilities of LLMs to, to do some really just crazy and, and weird things. Um, but yeah, I don't think you should necessarily do something like this in production. Your <laughs> colleagues would probably not be too happy with you um, if you just had a macro that just randomly just gave all your code away to an LLM. But it's pretty cool you can, right? So yeah. Um, yeah, so with that, that's, that's the talk. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Connor. I have mm -hmm. a question for you. Okay. Have you had any problems with like the indeterministic parts of the LM, LLM, and do you like put any safeguards around that to try to get a somewhat consistent response? Uh, there is no such thing as a consistent response for LLMs. It seems like, yeah, there is. Yes, it's a huge problem, and this is where you end up iterating so much on like the the, the natural language interface into these things tends to be the thing you, you you spend way more time on than writing any code at all. Just the getting tweaking the system prompt and trying to put those guardrails in is actually is, is quite a hard problem to get right. Um, and yeah, there's tooling is still coming out that sort of like is helping to like uh, in production settings to to um, really refine down and make sure that that certain things are only um, that it's always responding in a certain way, like uh, d different techniques for testing. But it's still kind of a bit of a wild west while we're learning these capabilities at the moment. And um, yeah, it's it's difficult. I think is the answer. <laughs> yeah.